live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 40th Annual Federal Society National Student Symposium. My name is Andrea Lelike, and I'm the president of the Penn Law Federalist Society. I would first like to take a moment to thank those who have worked tirelessly to ensure this year's symposium is a success. The Federalist Society organization, particularly Eugene Meyer and Peter Redpath, for the privilege of hosting this year's symposium and their guidance over the past several months. Those on the Federalist Society's tech team who have worked to bring as robust of a symposium as is possible in a virtual environment. Dean Ruger, the Penn Law Administration, and members of the Penn Law faculty who have provided support to our chapter, those who have agreed to be panelists for this event in particular, and the members of the Penn Law Federalist Society chapter, especially the symposium chair, Eric Makarov, for all the hard work and time they've dedicated to the planning of this symposium over the past year. The theme of this year's symposium is international law and US foreign policy. The great distance between the United States and its foreign adversaries and its status as a global superpower has provided a natural sense of security and shaped many Americans' attitudes on foreign policy and international law. However, with increasing frequency and intensity, global crises encompass the United States in their vast reach, serving as stark reminders that this nation is not immune from foreign perils. For the past two decades, the United States has found itself engaging in a variety of conflicts across the globe, confronting the rise of geopolitical rivals in both military and economic influence, and most recently combating the global impact of COVID-19. Recent events have brought the United States' approaches to globalization, free trade, and national security into question, shedding light on the need for an urgent conversation about the United States' place within the global community. This newfound focus on U.S. foreign policy brings an array of complex and contentious legal and political issues. Over the course of the next two days, you will hear from experts in the areas of constitutional law, trade, national security, human rights, and global governance as they engage in debate and conversation on these important issues. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Theodore Ruger, Dean and Bernard <coughs> Eagle Professor of Law here at Penn Law. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea, and, and I wanna thank uh, the, the national chapter and uh, our distinguished guests who will be speaking in the, today and tomorrow. And you know, most important, like, like so many good things that happen here at the University of Pennsylvania, Cary Law School, this is a student-driven, student-led, and I commend uh, Andrea, we like uh, uh, John Sargent, uh, Eric Makarov, and, and the other leaders of our Federalist Society for really envisioning this. Uh, the process started over a year ago. Um, the execution of this was complicated by the pandemic, as so much is, and, uh, and I saw from, a, from an, an admiring uh, and supportive kind of sideline position the way that uh, our student leaders and the national chapter has dealt with the shifting uh, logistical challenges and others um, in order to pull this off today. Uh, we have found, of course, in a year where we would rather be meeting in person for this as, as so much else, that um, I think a silver lining has been we sometimes have had bigger audiences, more engagement. I, I hope and I expect that some of you who are with us today may not have been able to travel to Philadelphia as much as many others of you would have liked to. And we look forward to hosting future events uh, in person when we can give you the kind of uh, uh, Philadelphia hospitality and, and sort of in, in the cradle of our democracy here. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make do with Zoom and, and look forward to uh, in the years ahead actually staying in more contact over the substantive issues of the sort we'll discuss today using this new technology. Um, the topic today could not be more timely or important. And I guess I would say, um, maybe I would say under discussed in the last few months or, or past year by both major political parties and, and figures as uh, I think it's hard for me to remember a presidential campaign in my lifetime. And I'm quite a bit older than the, than all the students that where there was, I think, less explicit or sort of conceptualized uh, debate and discourse over the, uh, this country's place in the world. Of course, there were debates over specific countries specific policies, but I think much more subsumed in debates about uh, domestic issues and, and uh, perhaps cultural issues. Um, so this is, there has been, uh, I think, insufficient discourse, both in the academy and, and nationally on the really important topics that will be discussed today. Um, secondly, and relatedly, and another reason I both commend the choice of topic and will be interested in, in listening to our expert panelists is, I think, um, in a world where um, on some issues we seem to be uh, perhaps fractured or even ossified into uh, 
uh, two camps on, on a number of issues. I think it's hard to think of an issue for me that is more nuanced or cross-cutting across both political parties and, and across a range of uh, thinkers from different methodologies or theoretical perspectives than these various uh, topics involving foreign policy and engagement with the world. Um, certainly both major political parties today have internal disagreements on the subjects that will be part of the panels. Um, I've always admired the Federalist Society, particularly since I was in law school and, and throughout my teaching and now decanal career for high, highlighting the kind of nuanced um, discussions and disagreements within conservative and libertarian legal thought and, and other perspectives as well. Um, and I think this is one where there's certainly not a standard view um, in either uh, either major political party today. And I'm really interested in how some of these issues about trade, about presidential authority, where I think all of us who study the presidency from whatever perspective have agreed that presidents of both parties in recent decades have dramatically expanded the power in ways that ought to concern and interest us. And I'm interested in that panel, the interpretive debate that we're about to uh, follow uh, on this panel with some of the, the leading uh, experts who I like to read about interpretation from various perspectives. So it's a really rich set of topics, a very important one. And I think one that, uh, as I said, has been, we haven't heard as much discussion nationally or even in the academy in, you know, in, in the past years as we've been arguing and debating about other things. So I, I appreciate that and, and look forward to it. Um, I want to thank um, an incredibly distinguished group of academic guests and panelists. Uh, judicial, um, and we've got uh, to, to the judges um, here. Thank you uh, for for your presence. It's it's in an ordinary year. One of the things I uh, enjoy most working with our Federalist Society students is the the range of distinguished jurists that come to campus and uh, help to help introduce them. And and so it's good to have your participation virtually. Uh, the policymakers that will join us, and I want to thank. Although I don't know if he's on the call today, but. Thank uh, Senator Lee for delivering the, the keynote uh, tomorrow night, and then we're honored to, to virtually host that event. Um, a few more words about our chapter and, and uh, you know, the discourse here uh, and the important role that our, our Federalist Society plays. Um, you know, we're, we're in an academic context where uh, debate can be fractious and roiling, and I think there's more speech than ever going around uh, on different medias and platforms, and it's not always civil. And, uh, and so certainly in the past several years as Dean, I have appreciated, indeed relied on our Federalist Society leaders, and it is the student leaders who set the tone to provide um, a kind of uh, intelligent, um, principled, stable kind of set of um, events and discourse and, and values that has um, succeeded well here and, and indeed succeeded numerically in terms of the number of students, which a few years ago increased over fourfold from, from one year uh, to the next, uh, led by uh, some tremendous student leadership that I did my best to support. Um, we've had, um, you know, most of that, as you know, the, and, and is sometimes lost in the media, the vast majority of federal society speakers who come here are uh, almost uniformly intelligent and, and erudite and not controversial at all. Um, we've had a few speakers who are controversial, and those speeches, thanks to the cooperation between our uh, FedSoc leaders and, and uh, other staff and faculty members here, those have gone off uh, smoothly and, and we kind of, it's very important that we kind of continue to collaborate to do that. And, and uh, this is, although virtual, this is a, another um, kind of a manifestation of that. I would say, and it was a, it was a pleasure, I think it, it seems like about five years ago, but two years ago, I had the privilege of welcoming Peter Redpath uh, into my office here where I'm all, all alone today, but uh, it was uh, back when we could congregate. And we were honored to receive, um, meant, meant a lot to us here in Philadelphia, the Benjamin Franklin uh, Award for Breakout Chapter of the Year. Now, I still have in my office for visitors, um, and I, I will say this shows the Federal Society's commitment to James Madison. That even the plaque for the uh, Benjamin Franklin Award is, we know this is not, this is not uh, Ben Franklin, this is James Madison. So we have a, this wonderful award. Uh, and then are proud to receive the Franklin Award and have the James Madison uh, uh, trophy here. And, and we appreciate that. And it's something that I keep uh, in my office uh, for visitors. Um, and we welcome, we, we look forward, Peter and, and your colleagues at the National, to, to be able to welcome you again. So it's, um, 
again, it's with gratitude for the, the really important role in our campus discourse that, that the Federalist Society and, and the student leadership plays and the important role in discourse and rule of law that the National Federal, Federalist Society plays that I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to help introduce this conference. I will say something not about the international or global topic, but just as a, as a dean of a law school, I think a lot about the rule of law. I think um, I worry about the rule of law at times in our kind of political discourse. Um, I actually think that the kind of lawyers involved and, and the judges, uh, those of us kind of steeped in the legal profession, um, I'm, I take a relatively more optimistic or positive view, even looking back at, at some of the uh, controversies of the past months and years. Um, it's heartening to see judges of both parties advancing the rule of law, uh, lawyers and, and law firms from different perspectives kind of adhering even as we disagree to certain principles. And, and I think um, we all play as, as current and future lawyers important roles in that going forward. I think the additional element that I see here is I think we do a really good job in, in both legal education and in our kind of legal profession at providing and advancing legal advice and the rule of law um, to a very thin segment of the biggest businesses and the most wealthy people in this country. And we have a new colleague here at, at, at Penn Carey Law School, uh, Jim Sandman, former managing partner of Arnold and Porter, and, and then the president of Legal Services Corporation of America. And, um, and we're working on something, and this is not poverty law or, uh, or kind of the most indigent, although it's, it certainly is that. It's really an issue about us as a profession and, and, and we as lawyers kind of taking this message and some of the important principles that will be discussed today and talking about them with non-lawyers, with people um, in the middle class, you know, in the below the poverty level, small businesses, not just big corporations. So it's a much bigger issue than just kind of a legal aid for the poor, although that's a component for it. And so, you know, one of the exciting things we're doing here is expanding the, the, the range of teaching and legal education we have specifically directed for non-lawyers. Um, and I encourage you, wherever you are at your institutions, think about how you're explaining constitutional principles and these important kind of rule of law ideas that we discuss and debate and form a certain framing uh, ballast to us, even as we disagree over specific issues. How are we translating that to the broader public? What can we do and what can each of us do as lawyers? What can all of our law schools do to get that knowledge out? And also to kind of uh, make the law and legal services and rule of law accessible to rural Americans, Americans in the cities, veterans, um, you know, the kind of, uh, I think what we've seen in, in past episodes is the inscrutability of some of these legal and constitutional principles that we know well and we debate and we'll be talking about in the next few days um, to the general population in the U.S. Um, has, has um, is something that I think we in the legal profession should do more to address. So that's my kind of decanal pitch for all of us uh, to kind of take the, the tremendous principle discussion that we engage in um, in various forums, including uh, the next two days. How can we translate that? How can we make sure that uh, people who aren't lawyers are, are also um, involved in the discussion? And I think that will ultimately help our, our polity and, and our profession. So um, with that, I, I am shifting to being an eager audience member on these terrific issues that are coming. And again, with appreciation for our student leaders and the national chapter, I turn it uh, back over. Thanks. Thank you, Dean Ruger. And thank you, Andrea. Uh, it's my pleasure to kick off the very first panel of the symposium. This afternoon, our excellent panelists will be discussing the role of international law in constitutional interpretation. Moderating them will be Judge Lisa Branch. Judge Branch was appointed to serve as a circuit judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit in 2018. From 2012 to 2018, she served as a judge on the Court of Appeals of Georgia. Prior to her judicial service, she spent her entire private practice career in commercial litigation at Smith, Gamble and Russell in Atlanta. From 2004 to 2008, Judge Branch was a senior official in the administration of President George W. Bush. She served first as the Associate General Counsel for Rules and Legislation at the Department of Homeland Security, and then as the Counselor to the Administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. After graduating from law school, Judge Branch served as a federal law clerk to the Honorable J. Owen Forrester of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Georgia. Judge Branch earned her JD with distinction from Emory University School of Law. 
She earned her BA cum laude from Davidson College. Judge Branch is a member of the Board of Advisors of the Atlanta Lawyers Chapter for the Federal Society. Without further ado, Judge Branch. First, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, I want to say a thank you to the Federalist Society and to the University of Pennsylvania Law School student chapter. Uh, Dean Ruger, thank you for those opening remarks. And Andrea, thank you for the role, your role in putting on this event today. Um, I truly enjoy attending and participating in Federalist Society events uh, as I have for many years. In fact, I served as moderator at my first student symposium out in Arizona uh, in 2019 and was truly impressed by the students that I met. And I'm so honored to participate again today. My only regret is a regret that I share with all of you, but um, in, in keeping with Dean Ruger's remarks, um, my regret is that this pandemic has prevented yet another in-person meeting. However, the Federal Society has done such an outstanding job with its virtual conferences, uh, both in 2020 and, and now, and I'm certain that this one is gonna follow suit. Uh, in any event, I am honored to kick off this year's student symposium with our first panel, and it's titled The Role of International Law in U.S. Constitutional Interpretation, in which we will explore the status of customary international law in U.S. courts, when there is congressional legislation or a US treaty and when there is not. And this is, as uh, Dean Ruger acknowledged, uh, a subject of, of somewhat passionate debate and our panelists will engage in this debate today. And just as a, a brief overview of the format for this panel, I will introduce the speakers and then I'll turn it over to them for their opening remarks. At that point, I will invite them to either make a short rebuttal or pose a question to another panelist. And then I will ask a few questions myself. I will ensure, however, uh, that there is time for audience questions. As you know, if you've attended Federal Society events in the past or and if you're learning it for the first time, please know that um, audience participation is really what makes a panel successful. So please be ready to join in at that time. Um, with that framework in mind, I will now briefly introduce, uh, introduce our esteemed panelists, and I will uh, do the introductions in the order in which uh, the professors will speak. Uh, first, uh, William Dodge is the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law and John D. Ayer Chair in Business Law at the UC Davis School of Law. He served as Counselor on International Law to the Legal Advisor at the State Department from 2011 to 2012 and as a reporter for the um, ALI's restatement for the foreign relations law from 2012 to 2018. He's written extensively on the history of international law in the US legal system among other topics. Uh, he is going to, uh, as our first speaker, he's going to provide a brief introduction to treaties and customary international law. And then he will uh, explain how the founders understood the law of nations and how the constitution uh, referred to it. He will also explain the ways that inter international law has changed since uh, 1787. Next up will be David Moore, who is the Sterling and Eleanor uh, Colton Endowed Chair in Law at Brigham Young University's J. Reuben Clark Law School, where he is also an Associate Director of the BYU International Center for Law and Religion Studies. His scholarship focuses on foreign relations law, international law, international human rights and international development. Uh, in 2020, Professor Moore served a brief term on the UN Human Rights Committee. He previously served as the acting deputy administrator and general counsel of the US Agency for International Development and also as a law clerk to Justice Samuel Alito. Um, Professor Moore will focus on two of the goals of the Constitution to empower the national government to prevent or respond to violations of international law and to create a federal government of limited powers and how those goals are accomplished. Uh, I next turn to Leah Brillmeyer. She is the Howard Holtzman Professor of International Law at the Yale Law School. She has taught at most of the nation's top law schools and is one of the country's foremost experts on the theory of conflicts of law as well as a recognized scholar in the international law fields of territorial and maritime boundary disputes, secessionist movements, mass claims commissions, and legal philosophy. 
She has had extensive experience as a litigator and consultant in American as well as international courts. Her academic writings are probably too many to count and in her words, definitely too many to read. Uh, she will discuss the contrast between our country's perception of its role in world politics now and at its founding and how the founders perception of that role would have affected their view of international law. And last but not least, uh, Nicholas Quinn Rosencrantz is a professor of law at Georgetown and a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. He earned his BA and JD from Yale and he clerked for Judge Frank Easterbrook on the Seventh Circuit and Justice Anthony Kennedy at the US Supreme Court. His articles are generally published in either the Harvard Law Review or the Stanford Law Review. And he serves as the board of directors, he serves on the board of directors at, of the Federal Society and as the faculty advisor to the Georgetown chapter. He will discuss uh, the US Supreme Court's 1920 case, Missouri v. Holland, and Congress's power to execute treaties. And so now I will turn uh, the, the microphone over uh, to Professor Dodge. Thank you, Judge Branch. Um, and, and thank you uh, to the Federalist Society for inviting me. Um, this, I'm looking forward to uh, the conversation today. So in 1900, the US Supreme Court said in the Packet Havana that international law is part of our law. Our panel is going to talk about whether that's true and what that might mean for constitutional interpretation. I want to begin with a few words about international law today. International law today generally consists of treaties and customary international law. Treaties are express agreements among nations. The Constitution sets out a process for entering treaties in Article 2, but U.S. practice also recognizes a category of international agreements known as executive agreements that don't go through the Article II treaty process and yet are binding internationally on the United States in the same way as treaties. And under the Supremacy Clause are binding on states in the same way as treaties. Customary international law is not formed by express agreement. It results from a general and consistent practice of states followed out of a sense of legal obligation. If lots of states act in the same way, and if they do so because they feel internationally obligated to do so, we say there is a rule of customary international law that binds all nations. There are some important issues in international law that are governed by customary international law rather than by treaties, including the international law on jurisdiction, sovereign immunity, state responsibility, and even the rule that treaties are binding on nations is a rule of customary international law. The framers of the constitution referred to international law as the law of nations. The law of nations that the framers knew looked different from international law today. Treaties were not too different and the framers called them the conventional law of nations. There were actually two different kinds of unwritten international law. First, there were rules based on natural law that every country was required to follow. These rules were confusingly called the voluntary law of nations, even though they were binding on countries without their consent. Second, there were rules based on state practice that were called the customary law of nations. And unlike customary international law today, a country could withdraw from a rule of the customary law of nations simply by declaring its intention not to follow it in the future. In the 18th century, the law of nations included some subjects that we would recognize as being part of customary international law today, like jurisdiction, sovereign immunity, and the laws of war. But it also included international commercial law and admiralty law, which today are considered part of domestic law. Now, following Blackstone, the framers understood the law of nations to be part of the common law. This was not federal common law or state common law, categories that really did not exist at the founding. It was general common law, and it was applied by both federal courts and by state courts. The Constitution refers to international law repeatedly both explicitly and implicitly. With respect to treaties, 
Article two sets up a process for ratifying them. Article three gives federal courts jurisdiction over cases arising under them. And Article six makes them the supreme law of the land binding on state courts. With respect to customary international law, Article one refers explicitly to the law of nations, giving Congress authority to define and punish offenses against the law of nations. Article one implicitly refers to the law of nations by giving Congress authority over areas that were governed by that law, including international commercial law and the laws of wars. The laws of war, excuse me. Now, although the constitution does not address whether Congress could exercise its legislative powers in ways that violated the law of nations, an early consensus developed that Congress could supersede the law of nations as a rule of decision in US courts if it clearly expressed an intent to do so. By contrast, the original understanding was that the president lacked authority to violate the law of nations without congressional authorization. Article two requires that the president take care that the laws be faithfully executed. It was commonly understood that the word laws in the take care clause included the law of nations. In the famous Pacificus Helvidius debate of 1793, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison disagreed on just about everything except that the president was bound by the law of nations under the take care clause. Article three permits federal court jurisdiction over many categories of cases that were likely to raise questions under the law of nations, including cases affecting ambassadors, admiralty and maritime cases, and cases between US citizens and foreign states and US citizens and foreign citizens. More generally, Article three permits federal court jurisdiction over cases arising under this constitution the laws of the United States and treaties. And the phrase laws of the United States is broader than the corresponding phrase one finds in article six. There is actually good historical evidence that the framers understood this phrase like the word laws in article two to include the law of nations. The first judiciary act of 1789 gave the federal courts jurisdiction in a number of these areas including jurisdiction over tort claims by aliens for violations of the law of nations, the famous alien tort statute. And finally, with respect to states, the supremacy clause in article six makes this constitution, the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties, the supreme law of the land. Now the law of nations is clearly not part of the laws of the United States that are made in pursuance of the constitution. But still there's an originalist argument for the supremacy of the law of nations over state law based on the structure of the federal system. And this is an argument that Alexander Hamilton made in a 1784 case under the Articles of Confederation before we even had a constitution or a supremacy clause. Over the next two centuries, International law changed significantly. First, the theoretical foundations of customary international law changed. During the 19th century, the voluntary law of nations, which was based on natural law, and the customary law of nations, which was based on state practice, but individual state consent, were replaced by a new positivist customary international law that was based on state practice but common consent, not individual consent. Second, the subjects covered by customary international law changed. Subjects like the law merchant became domesticated and were no longer considered part of customary international law, while new subjects like international human rights emerged. Third, even among the subjects that persisted, the rules of customary international law changed. For example, the idea that a nation had absolute and exclusive jurisdiction within its own territory eroded as new rules of jurisdiction and sovereign immunity developed. Fourth, the means by which nations enforced their rights under customary international law changed. At the founding, nations went to war to protect their rights under international law. Today, the UN Charter 
prohibits war as a means of enforcing a nation's rights, and countries turn instead to international tribunals and countermeasures. These changes mean that it is impossible to recapture the precise relationship between the law of nations and the constitution at the founding. But it's important to recognize that the founders themselves understood that international law had changed in the past and would continue to do so in the future. Early cases are full of references to the modern law of nations and early writers condemned as barbarous and deplorable practices that the ancient Greeks and Romans considered to be perfectly permissible. To interpret the constitution in light of international law today requires an act of translation. One might take the position that customary international law is federal common law that is binding on the president under Article II, cognizable in federal courts under Article III, and binding on the court, binding on the states under Article VI. One might take the position that because customary international law was part of general common law, and because Erie abolished general common law, then customary international law can never be part of the US legal system unless adopted by Congress or the states. The first of these positions has been called the modern position, but the second is no less modern. My own view is that all or nothing views on this are too simplistic and that each constitutional provision requires its own interpretation based on its own text, history, and place in the constitutional structure. But I would set forth a few basic principles that were important to the founders and should be important to us today. First, it is beyond question that the founders believed it was important for the United States to comply with international law. The international law that they knew was different, of course, but the founders knew that international law would change. Second, the founders believed that the president could not violate international law without authorization from Congress. Third, the founders believed that Congress should be able to give federal courts jurisdiction over a broad range of international law issues. Fourth, the founders understood that states could and would act in ways that implicated foreign relations, but also that the federal government should have authority to ensure their compliance with international law. In sum, this is an area of constitutional interpretation in which a pure originalist approach is impossible. Too much has changed, but one can identify core principles that the founders thought were important and that remain pretty good ideas today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dodge. Um, and uh, thank you, Judge Branch for that introduction and, and certainly to the Federal Society. Uh, for this opportunity. The Federal Society has uh, been an important part of my career, so it's a pleasure to be here uh, in a Federal Society event and with all of you uh, and uh, with my co-panelists who are all accomplished scholars. I want to um, build on what Professor Dodge talked about um, in terms of principles that motivated the founders in um, adopting the constitution. As I think of the concerns and particularly the foreign affairs concerns that motivated the constitution, one, one stands out to me. And that is the concern that part of the country, part of the nation, could generate foreign affairs problems for the nation as a whole without the nation as, as, as a whole having the tools necessary to respond to those or, or correct those, those violations. And so this, this collective action problem uh, arose during, uh, before the, the founding, um, during the period of Confederation, with regard to both the sources of international law that Professor Dodge, Dodge mentioned, uh, both treaties and customary international law. On, on the treaty front, front uh, the United States uh, entered the, the Treaty of Peace with Britain, which um, stipulated that British pre-war British creditors would meet with no lawful impediment in recovering on their pre-war debts. And you can imagine that this did not sit well uh, with uh, a country and a people who had just been through a, a terrible conflict. 
And so um, states uh, would enact laws that said things like, if you pay your debt to your British creditors into the state treasury, we will treat it as, as satisfied. Um, this was a clear violation of the Treaty of Peace with Britain and led to uh, friction with Britain and uh, the, the, the failure of um, Britain to, to vacate certain forts on our, our northern frontier. Uh, and so this problem of states um, not complying with treaties and creating, again, foreign relations problems for the nation as a whole was very much on the founders' mind. The, the same sort of dynamic existed with regard to customary international law. The famous um, incident that's, that's generally cited is the attack by a French citizen on the French consul general in, in Philadelphia. The national government lacked power to respond uh, to that incident, that violation of customary international law and the protections it prov provided to foreign diplomats and was left in a position of relying on the state of Pennsylvania to remedy the situation. In, in both these situations, the, the concern was not merely that there was a violation of international law, but this important dynamic that um, the national government did not have the tools to prevent a part of the nation from, again, incurring risk for the nation as a whole or um, pre prevent the, the national government from responding to international violations that otherwise would lead to foreign relations problems. So I think there's, there's no question that the Constitution sought to correct this problem. Um, <coughs> But um, that does not mean that in the course of trying to, to solve this collective action problem, the Constitution also sought to bind the national government to international law. So it's certainly one thing to say a part of the country uh, cannot cause foreign relations problems by violating international law. It's uh, logically a, a different matter to say that the country as a whole cannot make decisions that might risk uh, problems under, under international law. Uh, so as a matter of, of, of logic, um, this problem of state non-compliance or federal incompetence um, to respond to international violations um, does not necessarily lead uh, to a conclusion that the constitution binds the national government to, to international law. Uh, as we turn to history, I think history does not fill that gap and, and provide evidence that the founders wanted the Constitution to bind the federal government as a whole um, to, to international law. So um, as I've looked at um, the period of, of Confederation, again, the focus generally is on what the states were doing and the problems the states were creating. But it's interesting that the national government was also involved in important international law questions. And um, there are a number of uh, circumstances in which it appears that the, the national government was, uh, was playing fairly fast and loose with international law as, as well during that, that time period. Uh, let me just cite a, a, an example under both customary international law and treaties. Under customary international law at the time, Treaties were negotiated by agents of generally the monarchs uh, back in, in that time um, who carried with them a, a document called full powers um, that indicated that they were agents of their, their sending monarch. Once the agent signed uh, a treaty, uh, the country uh, was, the monarch was, was obligated under customary international law then to ratify unless the agent had exceeded uh, his authority. The United States um, departed during this period from that practice and started insisting that ratification was not merely a certification that the agent had acted within the scope of his agency, but was an opportunity to review a treaty and decide whether to uh, ratify and commit to its, its terms. Uh, Professor Dodge mentioned customary international law does evolve. Um, it, it often evolves through violation, through countries uh, adopting a different practice and then a new um, consensus forming around that, that new practice. Uh, but at that moment of, of change, 
um, there is there is violation, and arguably uh, the the national government during this period departed from this principle of of customary international law. We see similar um, situations with regard to treaties in these these early years, where, um, for example, our treaty of or excuse me our our, our alliance with France, um, which was so critical to our success in the revolution. Um, stipulated that neither France nor the United States would enter a peace treaty with Britain without the formal consent of the other. Um, notwithstanding this treaty provision, the U.S. ministers um, separately and secretly signed um, pre at least preliminary, uh, a preliminary peace agreement with Britain. Um, that agreement included a secret article um, and uh, the ministers indicated that they would be willing to uh, sign the final agreement without France if, if, if necessary. Um, so, so during this period, while there certainly is concern for state violation or federal inability to respond to, to or violations of international law, there's also evidence uh, that the national government was, was not uh, adhering to international law to a T. And when you turn to uh, the Constitutional Convention, the ratification debates, the Federalist Papers, uh, nowhere have I found an expression of concern that the national government was behaving in, in that way. The focus is consistently on the state violation and this collective action problem that again, a part of the country could impose um, uh, penalties or risks on the whole, as opposed to a concern that the whole could make choices under international law that could, could generate foreign affairs um, concerns. What appears in the Constitution, um, I think, confirms this sense uh, that the desire was to ensure that states could not incur problems for the country and that the federal government could um, handle foreign affairs concerns and that, that's reflected in the provisions of the Constitution that were actually uh, adopted. So the Constitution transfers foreign affairs powers to the federal government, the power to make treaties, for example, and specifically prohibits states from entering treaties. Uh, Article 6 makes treaties part of the supreme law of the land and goes on to specifically say that state judges need to uh, enforce federal law, notwithstanding contrary provisions of, of, uh, of state, even constitutional law. Um, Article one gives Congress the power to define and punish violations of the law of nations so that the federal government can respond to scenarios like the assault on the, the French Consul General. Um, Article three extends the judicial power to cases involving ambassadors, um, cases in, uh, arising under treaties, et cetera, such that the federal government had the power, Congress could create courts to deal with some of these issues uh, and not be reliant on the states uh, to, to deal with them. Um, so in my view, what we see in um, deriving from this, pri this, this uh, key concern and this key collective action problem is uh, a, an effort and uh, I think well accomplished in the constitution to give the federal government the tools it needs to comply or to ensure compliance with international law to prevent um, state non-compliance, uh, but not a principle that binds the national government to, to international law compliance. Um, so uh, the national government certainly can enter treaties pursuant to Article 2 or the other processes uh, Professor Dodge referenced, um, but can decide to make those treaties non-self-executing such that they are not immediately enforceable in our courts and um, don't um, automatically preempt state law. The tool is there to do it, but there's no compulsion on the national government to go that, that far. Um, similarly, the federal government can incorporate customary international law and authorize courts to apply customary international law to the preemption of, of state law. 
Um, but customary international law is, is not immediately supreme and, and does not bind uh, the federal government, leaving that discretion that seemed to be uh, accepted in, in uh, the course of constitutional formation. Um, to be clear, I'm not recommending uh, that the US violate international law. Um, international law, I think, has an important place, and there are critical reasons why the United States should comply with international law. Um, but I don't see uh, in either the concerns that uh, gave rise to the constitutional provisions on foreign affairs, in the history leading up to, to ratification, in the ratification process itself, a decision to, within the Constitution, bind the federal government to comply with international law. Rather, again, a decision to provide the federal government the tools to ensure that uh, the centralized power had control over uh, foreign affairs and the ability to decide if and when uh, to take on the risks of acting inconsistently with customary or customary international law or, or treaty provisions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Moore. Uh, let's turn now to Professor Brillmeyer. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much to the Federal Society for inviting me to this conference. Uh, it's really an exciting group of people and I'm having a lot of fun listening to all of you. Um, thank you, Judge Branch, for the uh, introduction and uh, Judge, uh, excuse me, um, Professor Dodge, I tend by nature to agree with uh, what you have to say. So thank you for expressing my opinions. And Professor Moore, thank you for teaching me something about uh, American history that I had no idea about. Uh, your theory about uh, the special role of um, uh, regulating the states is, uh, is really interesting to me. And I'd like to read more about it when I get a chance. Um, I'm going to, with the, with the tolerance of the panel, I'm going to depart a little bit from standard practice. Uh, panelists are usually asked questions. When, when you're on a panel, you expect to be asked questions by the audience. But what I really want to do is simply to mm -hmm. ask all of you a question. Um, because there's, uh, in thinking about preparing for this panel, a question occurred to me, which I hadn't really thought of before, and I'd be interested to hear the reactions of both the panelists and maybe also some people in the audience. And that is the role of a particular, um, what I conceive of as a historical fact um, in interpreting uh, the constitutional provisions about international law. So let's imagine when uh, several hundred years ago when the uh, constitution was being drafted uh, what is the attitude of the, um, the leaders of the United States, the important people, the ones that were drafting uh, the Constitution? What is their attitude towards their vision? What is their take? What is their, their picture of, of what international law is good for? And, and we heard Judge uh, Professor Moore's very uh, interesting ideas, very different from mine. I see the uh, mentions of international law in the Constitution from a rather different light, which, this, which is that this is a young, uh, remote, upstart, poor, and uh, not very well known um, new nation, which wants to be part of the club. And what club is that? Well. Um, the United States was uh, aspiring to join the same club that the European powers belong to, which was, um, I don't want to get into any arguments about uh, racism or anything like that, but it was predominantly uh, from a certain cultural uh, position. And this was who the, um, the framers of the constitution sort of identified. This was their group of people. They didn't think of themselves as being part of a community with the uh, Native Americans or uh, the uh, natives of Mexico or anything like that. They were part of the white European language speaking and European acculturated um, 
uh, society that their forefathers had been literally a part of. Now, why does that matter? Um, this is very important from the point of view of a young country that doesn't have a strong military presence, doesn't have the ability to project itself into other countries, uh, doesn't have a lot of commercial development the way the European countries did at this time. And from the point of view of a uh, poor and weak uh, upstart nation, uh, you need international law more than international law needs you because international law has some kind of uh, uh, ability to protect. And here I don't mean protect in the hard sense of an international police force, but I mean in the sense that when other countries think of you as being members of the same club, you're a, you're a country like our country, then they treat you differently. And if we need to be given examples of this, I would think of the uh, treatment that the Spanish um, crown gave to the various indigenous groups that were living in the uh, areas of Latin America that it conquered, where there was explicitly understood to be a principle of international law that these were uncivilized nations and didn't have the entitlement to the same kinds of respect and good treatment that civilized nations did. So if you are given a choice between either being the same, a member of the same club as France and a member of the same club as the Mayan Indians, well, you know what happened to them. So this isn't really much of a choice. Now, what do you want to communicate if you're putting some provisions about international law into your constitution? Uh, there's two things which are pretty closely related. And the first thing is you want to provide assurances that you think of yourself as being part of that club. And so you want declarations in, uh, in your written instruments that say, we are part of the law of the nation, law of nations. We are part of the same uh, culture group that treats each other in certain ways. Um, we, are, we are distinct with our interests in Europe as opposed to Latin America or Asia. And closely related to that, there's something of an enforcement mechanism. And again, I don't wanna overstate this because it's not much of an enforcement mechanism. But uh, when you provide jurisdiction in your courts for uh, uh, issues of international law or international commercial disputes to be brought, you're giving, some, you're giving the best kind of enforcement that you can. So this is what I see um, the United States doing when they put this in your in the, um, in the Constitution. And if you leaf through the Constitution looking for the various things that, um, uh, various places that international law is mentioned, um, you'll see a lot of uh, evidence that can be interpreted this way, although it could also be interpreted in a number of other ways, I realize. At any rate, I thought this was a rather friendly sounding um, uh, way to explain what the United States was doing. And a lot different from what our attitude is uh, towards international law today, where um, I think quite bluntly, the international law needs us more than we need international law, although it's not totally black and white. So um, the question I would leave um, you with is, is this the sort of thing that we would want as originalists, as I think many of the people listening to this panel consider themselves, is this the sort of thing that we would wanna take into account as originalists in interpreting what the constitution means? It seems prima facie to me that you would wanna take it into account, but I don't do constitutional law for a living unlike the rest of, uh, I think the rest of the panel, I do conflict of laws and we don't talk about important things like constitutional interpretation. So thank you very much and I'll just stop there. Uh, Professor Brillmeyer, thank you so much. And last but not least, let's turn to Professor uh, Rosencrantz. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be uh, with you today. Um, international law and uh, US constitutional law intersect at many different interesting points, uh, as you are already gathering. I'm just going to talk about one point of intersection, uh, particularly uh, treaties. So uh, the conventional wisdom and current doctrine is that there are two sort of flavors of treaty. 
uh, self-executing treaties and non-self-executing treaties. Self-executing treaties are domestic law of their own force. They are, from the perspective of uh, US courts, they are like a statute. Uh, but there's this other flavor of treaty, which is a non-self-executing treaty. And that is in the nature of a promise. So we go out into the world and we promise uh, the another country that we will uh, do something, but then we have to come back and do it domestically in order to uh, execute the treaty. So that's the category I'm gonna be talking about, non-self-executing treaties. Conventional wisdom also is that a treaty can uh, deal with matters that are not within the enumerated powers of Congress that you don't find in the list in Article 1, Section 8. That's at least the cur current conventional wisdom and current uh, doctrine. So um, the question arises, what happens um, when both those things, what happens when both those things happen? So we enter into a non-self-executing treaty about something that Congress does not have uh, enumerated power to address. Uh, and so in a case called Missouri v. Holland in 1920, uh, Justice Holmes for the court held that um, under those circumstances, Congress automatically gets the power. So even though Congress didn't have the power to pass this statute before, now they do have the power because we made this promise. So if we promise that Congress will pass some legislation, then the next day Congress automatically has the power to pass that legislation, even if they didn't have that power uh, before. Uh, so that's Missouri v. Holland in 1920. And I want to say that that's uh, wrong, that a treaty can't actually uh, do that, that Congress um, doesn't then automatically get the power that it didn't have um, previously. So I wrote an article to this effect in the Harvard Law Review many years ago called Executing the Treaty Power. And I marched through a bunch of arguments. I don't quite have time to march through them all for you today. So I wanna skip to some of the points that I think will most engage with what the other panelists have said. There are uh, textual arguments for this point. There are historical arguments for this point, which um, maybe we'll talk about a bit later. But I want to talk about the sort of basic general structural intuition, which is, isn't it odd, bizarre in a way, to imagine that this, um, that the framers of this document that were so concerned with an overreaching federal government and that made such a point of enumerating the limited powers of Congress and created such a an onerous mechanism for Congress to, for Congress's powers to be increased, right? In general, to increase the power of Congress requires a constitutional amendment. Isn't it bizarre to think that in addition to increasing Congress's power via Article 5, you can also increase Congress's power by entering into a treaty? Um, isn't that strange? And yet that's what follows from Missouri v. Holland. Um, it's actually, though, even a bit stranger than that. Uh, so under Missouri v. Holland, Congress's power can be increased, but think about who is doing the increasing. It's the president, the Senate, and some foreign government, and it can be any foreign government. And the power that is being increased is the legislative power, um, uh, the power of the House, the Senate, and the president. So you have the Senate and the president increasing the power of the House, the Senate, and the president, uh, you know, in a system that is um, really meant to be uh, um, provide checks and balances. This is really more in the nature of, uh, you know, giving foxes keys to hen houses, right? This is people um, having the power to increase their own power. Isn't that odd? Um, and if that seems, uh, if that doesn't seem odd enough, consider that um, treaties can also go away, right? They can be abrogated. So the president under current doctrine, the president can unilaterally abrogate a treaty. And what happens to the statute under those circumstances? Is the statute then rendered unconstitutional because it uh, no longer has the treaty to support it? Um, in general, the president only has, to, you know, only has a few days to veto a bill. 
And yet this is a sort of infinite veto, right? The president can just cause a statute to be unconstitutional by uh, abrogating the underlying treaty. Isn't that odd? And if that seems, if that's not odd enough, consider the president's not the only one who has this power. Actually, the foreign government also has the power to abrogate the treaty. And wouldn't it have struck the framers as odd to think that a duly enacted statute passed by the House, passed by the Senate, signed by the president, could subsequently be rendered unconstitutional at the discretion of, for example, the King of England. I claim they never would have put up with uh, any sort of implication like that, and yet that follows from uh, Missouri v. Holland. Um, so I argued Missouri v. Holland was wrong. The court actually took up a case that uh, seemed to present this question, Bond v. United States. Um, and I was delighted that Justice Scalia adopted this argument um, from my article and Justice uh, Thomas signed on. Uh, the bad news though is that's only two and you need five. So um, uh, happily though, the rest of the justices actually didn't take on this question. So they managed to avoid it altogether with a statutory interpretation. So we know that two justices agree with me and the other seven have not expressed a view. So there is actually hope that in a proper case, the court will overrule Missouri v. Holland. And I hope they do. Thanks. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Before I ask some questions, uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity if you wanted to provide a brief rebuttal to any of your co-panelists' remarks, or if you had a question that you wanted to address uh, to one of your co-panelists. I open the floor. Yes, Professor Dodge. So I just wanted to, uh, first of all, fascinating remarks, everyone. and. Um, lots to talk about, but uh, I told Nick uh, by email that I was going to ask him this question. So, uh, um, you know, even if you're right, Nick, about Missouri versus Holland and the treaty power, um, there's another Article One power that you could use to reach the same result, which is um, Congress has the authority to define and punish offenses against the law of nations. As I explained, the law of nations at the time the constitution was written included treaties. It, it, there was a branch of the law of nations that was called the conventional law of nations. So the original understanding of the offenses clause um, is that you could, uh, that Congress had authority to enforce treaties um, by uh, passing legislation. And I would say both criminal and civil legislation, civil liability. Um, so, I mean, I, it was great that Justice Scalia agreed with you, but the point's kind of moot because Congress has another power that it can do the same thing under. Isn't that right? Well, uh, so I thank you for the question and I thank you for giving me uh, uh, half an hour's uh, prep time on the question. Um, I, uh, you know, to fully answer it, I feel like I would really need to um, research that uh, clause. Um, the work that I've done is primarily on the treaty clause and necessary and proper clause. I'll just say, um, just sort of off the cuff, that just hasn't been the argument that um, anyone has made in supporting this use of congressional power. So the presumption has always been that this power from Missouri v. Holland on was to be found in the necessary and proper clause in conjunction with the treaty clause. So I haven't seen the court cite to the uh, law of nations clause for any such uh, use of power. And of course, the textual um, and historical arguments that I make are not on point for a different clause, but I think the structural arguments actually still are. I think the framers would have been, uh, the, the concerns that I expressed about ex, uh, expanding congressional power via treaty, I think have just as much bite, whether you're talking about the necessary and proper clause or the law of nations clause. And I think the framers would have been equally surprised to learn that Congress can, that Congress's powers can be increased by treaty under, under any or either clause. 
I would just say very briefly, my response on that point that you raised is political safeguards of federalism. You needed two thirds of the, of the Senate to pass a treaty um, and the framers very deliberately um, did that so that you would need, and, and remember the states were even more directly represented in the Senate at the time. Um, and so uh, if you got that many senators to sign off, that, that was the protection the states had against Congress overreaching. It's hard to make a treaty. It's almost impossible to make a treaty today. Um, so I just, I don't think there's anything to worry about on that score. Well, I guess I would say it's, this is not quite the political safeguards of federalism dynamic, because again, this is really um, the question being posed to the Senate is essentially the question, would you like more power? And I think if you ask any given senator that question, you can be almost assured of an affirmative answer. So, you know, if we enter into a treaty saying, uh, we hereby promise to regulate family law in the best interests of families, then the question that would be presented to any given senator is, would you enjoy having power over family law? And I think almost every senator is gonna tell you, yeah, they'd be happy to have that power or any power. Uh, yes, Professor Moore, you're still muted. Thanks, French. Um, so I wanted to pick up on something that Professor Brillmeyer said and, and then return to an issue that uh, Professor Dodge raised. Um, so I think there's a lot of truth uh, to Professor Brillmeyer's observation that at the time of the founding, we were a young, remote, poor country um, that uh, stood to gain more from international law compliance and becoming part of that community of, of nations um, under international law than, than otherwise. Uh, but I think there's some interesting counterpoints to that. I, I don't think, um, I think there's more texture and, and nuance in that. So I think, for example, of the neutrality controversy um, shortly after ratification of the Constitution, where um, we had relied on our Treaty of Alliance with, with France in the revolution, and it was critical to our success uh, in the revolution. But suddenly we found ourselves as a young, remote, poor country with a, a Treaty of Alliance with France and France uh, declares war on Great Britain, Spain, Holland, was already at war with Austria and uh, Prussia, I believe. Um, and arguably, uh, adhering to the international law meant siding with France in this uh, conflict. But of course, that's the same underlying uh, considerations that we were young, remote, poor, um, led President Washington to decide this would be disastrous for us to get involved in a European war. Uh, and so notwithstanding our treaty of alliance um, proclaim neutrality in, in that controversy. Uh, and so it, it didn't always point one way, I think, toward, toward international law compliance. Though I think as an abstract matter, certainly um, the balance tends toward seeing international laws as, as a tool to, to help us. Um, I think also, as I, as I mentioned, you know, even though we were a young, poor, remote country, we departed from this customary international law norm that if we signed something, we would ratify it. Uh, and we insisted, even with powerful countries, um, that signature did not mean consent and consistent with Article 2, that there needed to be uh, some sort of congressional or senatorial review of treaties before we, we signed on. Um, so, uh, you know, the Constitution in that sense pushed against uh, compliance with, with customary international law at the time. Uh, and one other example, uh, we mentioned the, the define and punish clause, um, certainly uh, had the, the, the commitment been as strong as uh, perhaps has been suggested to compliance with international law, um, compliance wouldn't have been left to Congress taking steps, giving Congress the discretion or authority to define and punish violations of international law. But uh, there, there could have been an express provision uh, simply saying we will comply uh, um, with, with customary international law. And so, um, again, I, I think there's um, uh, a fair amount of texture there that uh, e even though we were, uh, as you say, 
uh, young, remote, poor, right? It, it didn't lead consistently um, or as far as that could have to commitment to, to international law. Um, turning, turning to an issue that Professor Dodge mentioned, customary international law and its role in, in federal courts. And this picks up on Professor Rosencrantz's theme that um, another concern at the founding was that we create only a, lim a limited federal government, a government, a federal government of, of limited uh, federal powers. And he's pursued that in the treaty context uh, to argue that the treaty power was not meant to expand uh, Congress's enumerated powers. But we run the same risk of uh, expanding really exponentially the power of the federal government if customary international law is treated as, as federal common law, post Erie federal common law, uh, where the federal courts could reach out, cite principles of customary international law and uh, preempt state law uh, to the extent it, state law were, were, was, is inconsistent with, with that law. And I think that pr problem has become really pronounced uh, because of the expansion of, of international law. So back in the founding, you know, customary international law, I mean, it, it, as Professor Dodge mentioned, right, um, things like human rights uh, would not have been subjects of international law at, at the time. Um, family law uh, would not have been a subject of, of international law. Um, but as international law expands to address these areas that have been areas of traditional state regulation and that weren't delegated to the federal government, treating customary international law as federal common law would, through the courts, um, allow the federal government to regulate far more uh, potentially than the Constitution uh, expressly permits. And I think there's not just the concern of the expanding scope but also the process through which customary international law is made and the uncertainty of, of that process. Um, just to cite a, a recent example from my own professional experience, uh, as mentioned in my introduction, I, I had the opportunity uh, last year to serve a brief term on the U UN Human Rights Committee. And that committee is charged with interpreting the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, one of the principal human rights treaties. Um, I have great respect for that committee and my colleagues on that committee, but one of the things that surprised me is that there was very little attempt to follow international law in interpreting that treaty. So the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, customary international law, provides principles that, that are meant to guide, that, that dictate how you interpret a treaty. Um, but there, there was, you'll see in the committee's jurisprudence, there is very little reference um, to that, to, the, to, to those provisions. Um, most of the decisions were norm driven. Um, and so um, it, it does raise concerns that under the international process, we can have sort of these unaccountable bodies, um, not even following international law, right? But uh, adopting norms that they find compelling uh, and then treating that um, as, as a form of supreme federal law in the United States, where it hasn't, you know, we don't have the same sort of protections that the Constitution has, has contemplated. Um, so I think we get that same dynamic that Professor Rosencrantz was talking about with the treaty power, um, if we treat customary international law as, as federal common law. And of course, Professor Dodge has indicated he doesn't think it's that um, categorical, uh, that it's a more, more nuanced question. Uh, Professor Brillmeyer, do you have a response? Oh, you're still muted. There you go. Uh, um, I would just say that I'm not sure that I think, uh, although I understand that the uh, situation is more uh, diverse and nuanced than I had been describing, I'm not sure that the examples that you gave are, are probative of that because um, what they're really examples of is the different interests that a state or any uh, party that's involved in making a commitment, the difference in interests that it has between ex ante and ex post. And ex post, there's always gonna be an interest in, uh, in violating your commitment and doing whatever you feel like doing at that time. The question that I was addressing was, is, is it in the interest of the uh, poor and weak country to be able to make commitments 
even though it may turn out that they uh, are inconvenient at times, uh, it's very much in the interest of a poor and weak country to do that. And you think now the best example of that is probably the ability of um, developing countries to get uh, loans and international commercial agreements with more powerful states. The ones that really need those agreements are the, uh, the developing countries, not the more powerful states. So um, I think you might uh, probably, you'll probably have some other uh, counterexamples to uh, prove your point, though. Thank you. Professor Dodge. I'd just like to make three very quick points in, in response to what has been uh, said, the points that have just been made. First, uh, to Professor Bromeyer's question to us all, um, or, or one way of addressing it, I think it's important for us now as a very strong country to keep in mind that the international institutions we set up after World War II were things that we created. In fact, international human rights law writ large is largely something the United States created. And we created it um, for good reasons and to serve our own interests. It does sometimes bind us in ways we don't like to be bound. But one of the advantages is it binds other people's people too in ways that we would like to see them be bound. And so there's a trade-off and yes, we give up sovereignty, but I think um, in general, we gain more from that bargain than we lose. Um, with respect to um, the ICCPR and the experience of interpreting it, I believe you completely, Professor Moore, in your, in your uh, that rings true to me. Um, I would say that the ICCPR in particular, the United States has joined it, but considers it a non-self-executing treaty. So. Congress made that determination that states are not bound um, by that. And that leads me to my last point, which is, you know, some, there's a debate sometimes that we've not really engaged in yet about whether international law should be used and customary international law should be used um, to interpret things like the Eighth Amendment, uh, ban on cruel and unusual punishment. And um, I think what, it, Professor Moore has expressed some, some doubt that that would be a good idea because um, it would bind the states um, to this sort of undemocratically made law. But think about what the Supreme Court did instead of, um, I mean, so I, I would say that if customary international law bound the states directly, then maybe they wouldn't be able to execute juveniles. Um, but if Congress wanted to authorize them to do that, it could. In other words, Congress could step in and authorize state violations of international law. What actually happened was not, of course, that. What actually happened instead was that the Supreme Court constitutionalized the same rule and said that states cannot ex uh, execute juveniles. And there's no way Congress can override that except by constitutional amendment. I think actually having international law apply directly to states with the ability for Congress to authorize violations is a more conservative way to go than what the US Supreme Court has been doing in the Eighth Amendment area um, in the case of capital punishment. Professor Moore. Sorry, Nick, did I see you raise your hand? I've. Uh, yeah. Um, Why don't you go... step in? I've already had a chance to speak. Okay, I was just gonna pick up since um, the uh, ICCPR has been mentioned, I thought I'd maybe explain how that um, uh, intersects with the Missouri v. Holland question. From 1937 to 1995, the question that I'm considering barely mattered because it seemed that Congress's legislative power was essentially infinite. But then we got Lopez and Morrison and the suggestion that there are indeed some things that are beyond Congress's enumerated powers. But the ink was barely dry on those opinions when international law scholars started writing articles saying, ah, but um, Missouri v. Holland and the ICCPR. So why don't we just enter into a treaty with some country promising that we'll ban guns near schools? Or why don't we enter into a treaty with some country promising that we'll regulate violence against women or whatever it is? And then couldn't Congress go back and pass the exact same statute that Congress, that the court had already said Congress lacked the power to pass? And um, the 
uh, that, that is indeed an implication of Missouri v. Holland, that you could go back and pass those identical statutes again if you could just find a willing uh, treaty partner. And again, I think that, you know, framers would be shocked by that suggestion. Professor Moore, I had, you, you had one remark. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, in response to Professor Dodge's last point that um, the ideal uh, arrangement in his view would be international law applies to the states unless Congress authorizes otherwise. And I think, um, you know, that flips things on its head in the sense that there were a lot of procedural hurdles set up for Congress to be able to preempt state law. Uh, and this would flip it so there would be a lot of procedural hurdles getting to Congress authorizing states to do, do certain things. So I think there is a, a bit of concern there. And I just wanna say more, more broadly, uh, um, um, sometimes um, these process arguments, I think are viewed as anti normative arguments, right? So I, I just wanna clarify, you know, uh, Professor Dodge, for example, talks about uh, international human rights. And I think international human rights is immensely uh, important. Um, I guess in, in combination with that, I think process matters. Uh, and that um, I, I, I think the constitution was brilliant in establishing structures and processes that also protected individual liberty. And so I, I wouldn't want us to think of these as um, mutually exclusive avenues for looking at these pro problems, right? Do we like the norms or do we reject the norms in favor of, of process? My, my goal is generally, let, let's try to see if we can get both. <clears throat> All right, and I have a question, and um, not to uh, pick on Professor Dodge, uh, but at the end of his opening remarks, and I'd like a reaction from the other panelists, uh, he says, this is an area of constitutional interpretation in which a pure originalist approach is impossible. Too much has changed. And I was wondering if any of the other panelists had a reaction to that. Professor Bilmeyer? Oh, you're still muted. Professor, you're still muted. There, uh, there you go. There, okay. Um, oh, now, for, now I, that made me forget what the question was. Uh, in, in his, in, in Professor Dodge. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, about, about originalism. That's, it's, it's an argument that you would make about every possible constitutional question that there's so much has changed. If it's acceptable here in inter international law, then it would be acceptable in every other part of uh, constitutional law as well, which, which might be the right answer, but I think all, area, all areas of constitutional law are ones that um, Professor Dodge could make that claim to as just as well as with international law. Professor Moore? I'll just quickly step in and, and uh, decide with Professor Dodd. I do think there's the, the changes that have happened in international law are so fundamental um, that we are stuck in so many ways with translating an initial intent, and there are really difficult questions about you know whether that translation is is possible. So um, I, I do see something uh, unique here. Well, you know, I think we could actually take a step back and ask, you know, what is the function of customary international law today? So it made all kinds of good sense when um, communication took a long time and there was no United Nations. But, you know, you might ask, why should we have any such commitments as against treaties, which are written down and we can, um, uh, bring normal textual analysis to bear. So, you know, I think you could have a, a vision of international law that is um, quite consistent with the framers' vision if, you know, our international legal commitments were essentially all treaty commitments. Can I respond just briefly to that point? Absolutely. So, um, you know, there are... As, as Professor Rosencrantz knows, you know, there's been an explosion of treaties um, since, uh, since the framing. And, and we, 
many, many important subjects are now dealt with in treaties. And that's probably a good thing. Um, there are some important areas that are still governed by customary international law. One area that I'm writing about right now is the immunity of foreign officials. The immunity of states is governed by the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, but the Supreme Court held 10 years ago that that doesn't apply to foreign officials. So, you know, what does govern? The Supreme Court has said it's common law or federal common law, but um, it's unclear where a court should be looking for that law. There is customary international law on this. And I think it's important that the Queen of England be immune from suit, not just in federal courts, but in state courts. In other words, that the customary international law of head of state immunity binds the state courts of Georgia, just like it binds the federal district courts in Georgia. Um, that's, you know, that may seem like a trivial example, but it's not, it's not if you're a foreign official and you get sued. Um, but isn't that a matter that could be addressed by treaty? And isn't that true of all of customary international law? It, it could be, but then you need 192 countries to agree on the treaty. Even some treaties like the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations or the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations are not universally um, adopted. The State Department takes the position that even that they represent customary international law that was pre-existing and therefore are binding on the United States internationally and well, and I would say on the states um, as a matter of customary international law. So sometimes, you, you know, treaties and custom often work together, I guess is the point. But, it, but isn't that just the point is that you, you would have to affirmatively agree. And, uh, you know, as you point out, um, back in the day, it was possible to opt out of aspects of customary international law that you didn't like by saying, I don't like this one, I'm not going to comply, which is to say, we could be, it, it was easy at the framing to be in perfect compliance with your international legal commitments, because you could always just say, I'm not going to comply with that one. That was true of the customary law of nations. There were natural law rules that you couldn't opt out of. Um, but yes, I mean, it was different. It was quite different. Um, you know, again, I think that there are practical barriers to entering treaties. I, I think th the more we can have international agreements and treaties, the better, but it isn't always possible. And in, there are some important international law issues um, where the United States needs a way of complying with custom. And then the question that I think we've been discussing is what are the best ways to do that within our constitutional system? I just mean, as you engage in the process of translation, you usually look for the sort of the, the larger principle that was reflected in the regime and see how that principle would translate. And I would suggest one of the underlying principles was um, the ability to opt out. Yes, Professor Brillmeyer. Uh, Professor, you're you're flipping back and forth between mute and unmute. There you go. Uh, okay. Um, I have a question about Missouri v. Holland. There's really two kinds of uh, limitations on federal power. One is that the grant of federal power is simply not infinite. There are things that are covered and things that aren't. So if you have an exercise of federal power that's outside what's been granted, there's a constitutional problem with it. But sometimes a, a, a federal action is within a, an enumerated power, but it violates another constitutional provision. Now, I know un, that Missouri against Holland applies to the first type of federal power. Are you also claiming that it applies to the second? Uh, I am claiming it and the court has claimed it and the case is Reed v. Covert. So, oh, um, yes. so yes. if we enter into a treaty promising that we will go back and violate the Bill of Rights, Congress does not thereby obtain the power to violate the Bill of Rights. And so my claim is a ruling Missouri v. Holland would actually, Missouri v. Holland's actually the anomaly and Reed v. Covert is correct. It's, you cannot, Congress can't get power to violate the Bill of Rights via treaty. And I claim they also can't get power to exceed their enumerated powers via treaty. That's what I thought, thank you. 
And, and this has been a great discussion among the panelists. Um, I do want to be mindful. We have about 30 minutes left. Um, I want to turn it over to the students. And we actually do have some questions. So I'm just going to tackle some of these. Um, let me start with Daniela Cass. And she asks, how does the United States maintain sovereignty and proper limits on the power of the federal government with respect to international law without isolating itself from the developing body of international law? Should the U.S. be involved in developing this body of law? And whoever wants to jump in. Professor Moore. I'll just say, um, I do think it's important that the United States is involved in uh, the creation of international law. I would say the way we often do it now is... Um, uh, uh, ugly is too strong, right? But essentially we're such a power that even if we aren't gonna commit to it, you ought to have us at the table, right? Um, uh, so, so by the sort of mere uh, exercise or flexing a, of power, I think we have an opportunity to, to be involved. But, but I, I think some of the discussion we've had might leave the impression that um, international law should not have a place or we need to, to, to limit the place that it has. And in some of these questions, it's not, it's not um, the conclusion is not that international law should not have a role in the US legal system, but how it should have that role. So if customary international law is not federal common law, that means we ought to be focusing less on bringing litigation to the courts to try and get customary international law uh, interpreted and applied, and more on focusing and going to Congress uh, to get Congress to incorporate customary international law. Uh, and, and in either process, you know, whether it's at the courts or Congress, the United States would therefore have a, have a role. Um, it's just that, in, in my view, uh, Congress, uh, going to Congress is more consistent with principles of limited federal government uh, and, and other uh, constitutional uh, principles. All right, anybody else before we, we have another question as well. All right, uh, from Cole Campbell, to what extent should the manipulation of international institutions by adversaries such as China influence our approach to incorporating international law? Anyone? Professor Brillmeyer? Oh, you're muted, there you go. Um. I think uh, if we were to take that into account, we'd have to take into account the amount that the United States does to manipulate international institutions. And uh, this is not um, a, but what about type of argument at all. I mean, that uh, I think that it's uh, sometimes a very good thing that the United States does that. And sometimes it's a good thing that other countries do that. And I don't see why uh, legal manipulation should affect anything. Professor Dodge. Yeah, I, I agree with the point and uh, with Professor Bromeyer's point. I, I really think that, um, you know, so China joined, I remember when China joined the WTO um, in, in 2001. Um, China did not automatically become the um, democratic rule abiding country that we, that some people might have hoped uh, it would be. And we have legitimate grievances with China. Um, both we and China will be a lot better off if we can resolve our differences within the context of institutions that have rules and dispute settlement. Um, where And the United States and China have both become very active before, back when the WTO was functioning, before the Trump administration refused to appoint people to the appellate body and basically stopped it from functioning. Um, uh, both the United States and China were very successful um, very, very uh, big users of the WTO system and frequently suing each other. Um, I think both countries gained from that. And, and I really do worry that the direction our countries, both of our countries are headed in at the moment is one that leads to military confrontation, which I think would be disastrous for the United States, disastrous for China, disasters for all the countries that lie in between them, physically in between them, um, and for the world economic system. So I think that um, we need to do a lot more talking and a lot less saber rattling. 
Anyone else have a response to that question? Let me turn now to a question from Valerie Kendrick and a reminder to the audience, uh, now is the time if you've got questions. We've got several teed up, but I wanna make sure that everybody has an opportunity to ask. Valerie Kendrick states that she doesn't disagree with the idea that international law applies directly to the states, but what she disagrees with in Missouri v. Holland is the idea that the Senate can authorize a treaty agreeing to do something in excess of Congress's delegated powers. It's ultra vires. Is she understanding this correctly? Are people advocating that it's okay for the Senate to do so? Professor Rosencrantz, perhaps you kick that off? Sure, uh, I think I actually disagree with the premise of the question, but it is a controversial point. Um, I think that the president and Senate do have the power to enter into such treaties. So I think they can enter into treaties that promise to do all sorts of things um, that Congress may lack the power to actually uh, do. Um, and uh, there are, I think, good, um, so as a general matter, I think it would be a bad idea for the President and Senate to do that. I think they generally shouldn't. But you can imagine extreme examples where that would be a useful power. Uh, so if we were to lose a disastrous war, you could imagine the president and Senate wanting in the peace treaty to agree to some term, which uh, Professor Brillmeyer, to your prior question, um, violates a provision of the Bill of Rights, right? So, uh, you know, we say um, the, you know, the country that conquers us says, yes, you can maintain some military bases, but you have to allow for military trials of spouses you know, contra read be covert. Could we enter into that treaty? Um, uh, could we enter into that treaty, even though implementing it would violate the Bill of Rights? I say, yes, we could. But what it would mean is we have to go home and then amend the Constitution in order to change the scope of Congress's power, the scope of the rights in the Bill of Rights. Um, obviously, that would be an extremely rare circumstance, but it's it's the kind of thing that the framers would have uh, considered. And structurally, it's just not so different from what we usually do. So um, we enter into a treaty and a treaty, a non-self-executing treaty is generally a promise to go home and use Article 1 to implement it. But there's no reason why a treaty couldn't be a promise to go home and use Article 5 to implement it. This treaty could promise that. And I think you know, there might be circumstances in which that wouldn't be bad, or at least when it might be necessary. Professor Dodge. There have also been efforts in, with respect to some treaties to use, um, uh, to use state law to implement treaties. And in fact, frequently the, the State Department won't agree to a treaty that touches on areas involving state law without being convinced that the United States is already in compliance. So in, a, in other words, it's not, we don't execute the treaty after the fact, we've executed it before the fact. Um, the, the example that I was, this is an obscure example to most people, but the United States signed at the very end of the Bush administration on the last day, signed, the Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreements. Um, and then there was a long discussion about how that should be implemented because um, it involves uh, jurisdictional and, and um, judgments questions that have traditionally been um, the subject of state law, not federal law. Unfortunately, discussions between the State Department and the Uniform Laws Commission broke down and um, we are, we, it still has not been submitted to the Senate for ratification. But th th what it shows is that there's at least the possibility of executing treaties. Um, so if Professor Rosencrantz is right and there are things that Congress just can't do, there are potentially other ways of addressing it. It's just a lot more complicated. Anyone else? Uh, this is a question uh, from Harrison directed to Professor Rosencrantz. Um, have any recently appointed justices indicated support for the Scalia Thomas position in bond? Uh, no, not as far as I know, but they uh, certainly have expressed concern um, about enumerated powers. So, 
Um, I'm, uh, I expect that they will be sympathetic to some of the structural concerns that I'm raising, I hope. And this, does anybody else have a comment on that? Uh, this is a question from Jeff. Um, he thanks all of you for a great discussion. He said, um, brief mention was made to the Alien Tort Claims Act, and he was part of a group that had studied it uh, as a basis for holding perpetrators of torture and other grave breaches of international law accountable in US courts. COBOL was handed down mere weeks before we rendered our findings, and so the angle was abandoned. Are the panelists aware of any recent developments or jurisprudence of note in this area since the 2012 decision? Thanks in advance. Professor Dodge. So yes, there there are a bit more. A lot of the recent uh, stuff has been in the area of corporate liability, and so um, there was the Jessner decision in 2018, and we're expecting perhaps as early as next Thursday a decision in the Carville and Nestle cases on corporate liability. In in Jessner, the Supreme Court held that the ATS cause of action does not extend to foreign corporations. The question in Cargill and Nestle is whether the ATS uh, cause of action extends to US corporations. Um, that's really where the action has been. There are also lower court decisions um, involving uh, Kiobel's touch and concern test. The circuits are somewhat split on what is necessary to um, uh, meet that test, um, uh, but uh, the, the ATS is on its last legs, I would say. And um, I say that as someone who spent a fair amount of my scholarly career working on it. So I say it with, uh, with um, sorrow, uh, but you know, the facts are what the facts are. Bill, can I ask on that, um, do, do, are you expecting also the court to comment on touch and concern and extraterritoriality in Nestle? As I recall, that was also an issue, though. I don't. I don't know if I haven't followed arguments, et cetera, to know that. Yeah, m maybe I don't know. I, you know, I, uh, I, as someone who also writes a lot about extraterritoriality, I fear that this is a very bad case for the court to be addressing that question in, um, because I know how a majority of the justices are going to want to come out on the question. I just don't know how they're going to get there. And from my point of view, there are better and worse ways to get there. Um, and I've got, I feel like I love, have a lot of dogs in this fight. So <laughs> I, um, I'm not sure which of them I want to get bitten. All right, we have a follow-up to Professor Rosencrantz uh, to the question that Valerie had asked earlier. Um, she said, she's not sure she understood your point. She would agree the Senate can agree to do something beyond its powers. It's just, it is just a meaningless argument that can't be carried out in the absence of a constitutional amendment. But can they approve a self-executing treaty authorizing something beyond their enumerated powers? Uh, conventional wisdom is that we can enter into a self-executing treaty beyond the enumerated powers of Congress. That's current doctrine. I haven't really taken that question on, but that is the current conventional wisdom. We cannot, though, enter into a self-executing treaty that violates the Bill of Rights. So that's a, that's the sort of current doctrine. I'm not taking on either of those questions here. I'm taking on the question of what happens when a non-self-executing treaty purports to go beyond enumerated powers of Congress. Uh, thank you. Um, Professor uh, Rosencrantz, um, we've talked a lot about Missouri v. Holland. You teed that question up. Is there a historical argument in favor of it? And, and what would that be? Um, yeah, it's a kind of an interesting uh, um, uh, scholarly, the, the scholarly history is sort of interesting. So um, Missouri v. Holland was, um, was Justice Holmes, 1920, but he decided the question in a couple of sentences with really no argument at all. Uh, but then in, um, in the leading uh, treatise on this, um, on um, international law, or the um, constitutional, uh, constitutional inter uh, the relationship between constitutional and international law, um, the treatise uh, argued that, or presented the historical argument that um, 
uh, draft of the US Constitution Necessary and Proper Clause actually included the power to execute treaties, that it actually said that in the Necessary and Proper Clause in draft, and that they had um, removed that clause from the Necessary and Proper Clause because they thought it was superfluous. And that, se that seems like an extremely powerful argument from constitutional history. It's sort of the best kind you can have, right? There was the draft, there was the change, and we know why there was the change because they thought it was superfluous. The implication being Congress has the power to execute treaties even absent this uh, clause. And so I thought that was a very persuasive historical argument as did the court for a generation. Um, until I looked back at the drafting history and found that it was simply false, simply just wasn't the case. So um, that, that actually was the historical argument that had sustained Missouri v. Holland for a generation, but it's, it isn't so. There never, there never was such a thing. Anybody have a response to that? Uh, Professor Moore, uh, I have a question for you. Um, what what constitutional concerns would result from, from a greater role for the judiciary in applying international law? Yes, yeah, so I think I've uh, alluded to that some. Um, in the context of customary international law, that as international law expands, this would mean that um, state law could be preempted without uh, overcoming the hurdles to federal lawmaking um, that you know, otherwise exist. Um, so I, I, in, in a sense, it sort of um, could be an end run around you know, constitutional lawmaking processes. And I suppose if I were more comfortable with the process by which customary international law is made and identified, um, you know, plus more persuaded uh, that the, the founders in the Constitution wanted to incorporate that source of international laws as a form, a form of, of supreme federal law, that it wouldn't be so, so troubling to me. But, um, but I have uh, concerns on, on both fronts. When it comes to treaties um, and this question of whether treaties are self-executing and therefore immediately enforceable, I also tend to see more room for non-self-execution, um, again, under the theory that the Constitution gave the treaty makers the power to, to enter treaties that would preempt state law, um, but didn't compel them to do that. Um, just as it doesn't compel them in making a constitution, the constit constitution makers or um, stat legislatures to pass uh, statutes that always preempt state law or something along those lines, right? You look at the Bill of Rights and it didn't apply to the states or, and we presume that statutes don't preempt uh, st state law. So I think the power is there in the constitution uh, to enter treaties that can immediately preempt state law through judicial enforcement. Um, but again, that the, the constitution doesn't compel that result and leaves um, discretion in the political branches to, to decide how far they want to invoke uh, that, that power. And, and I think that's helpful in part because um, international treaty making is, um, can be a very uh, sort of political slash aspirational um, slash gradual process. Uh, and so not every treaty is going to provide judicial standards or, or clear sort of specific law. And I think there ought to be uh, uh, the possibility that our treaty makers can enter treaties like that, that are vague and abstract and aspirational and maybe um, help us in, in moving China forward toward human rights, more human rights compliance or something along those lines. Um, without the risk then that this provides uh, new constitution-like standards like due process, et cetera, that the courts uh, can sort of have a heyday with in deciding what that means and what's prohibited under, under uh, state law. Um, so I think, you know, both sources of, of international law, uh, I have concerns about going through the courts um, to, to decide questions of, of 
status uh, in, in the US legal system. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and as we're wrapping up this panel, um, I just wanna give the panelists one last opportunity, just a final thought, if there's anything that you have left to say, uh, be glad to hear from you and then I'll wrap things up. Um, maybe one last thought, I, you know, I think a sort of theme is um, we all agree that it's important in some sense for the US to comply with its international legal commitments. But to sort of, kind of drill down into that instinct, I think I might you know, want to phrase it slightly differently. It's important for the US to be able to comply with its international legal commitments if it wants to. And the way in which uh, the framers ensured that we could is that we had control over what our international legal commitments were, uh, either via treaty or via opting out of the parts of customary international law that we didn't like. Um, and likewise, you know, people have criticized my Missouri v. Holland claim by saying, well, but it wouldn't be bizarre and bad if we could enter into these treaties and then be unable to execute them. And you know, the simple answer to that point is, don't make promises you can't keep. Don't make promises you can't keep. And uh, if we, if our political branches adhere to that general principle, we won't have ever this problem of we're not in compliance with our international legal commitments involuntarily. Anyone else have a final thought? Professor Dodge. I would just picking up on some of the things that Professor Moore was saying. Um, I would stress the limited nature of international law. Um, customary international law rules are actually quite limited in scope, even in the human rights area. Um, satisfying a general and consistent practice of states and the sense of legal obligation or opinion of yours is hard. It doesn't mean whatever the interpreter thinks should be the law. You have to be able to point to what states are actually doing and then show that they're doing it for a particular reason. Um, similarly, treaties are hard to enter into. And, um, uh, and that's probably the way it ought to be because um, for the most part, uh, I do think the United States government and other governments should be running their own shows. Um, but there are areas in which we do need to cooperate. And I do think we need a constitutional structure. And I think we have a constitutional structure. Um, that facilitates appropriate cooperation on issues that are important. Thank you. I'll, I'll just respond uh, briefly to that. I, you know, the way uh, Professor Dodge describes international law is um, the way I, I would like to see it function. Um, but I, I, I don't think that international law scholars or practitioners of international law feel bound to a um, to a very definitive limited definition of, of customary international law. So when our courts apply customary international law, um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find an opinion that looks broadly at what states are actually doing. Um, I think they're likely to call an expert in on both sides, or they're likely to look at what past court said or what declarations from the General Assembly of the United Nations say. It's really hard to pin down what states are actually doing, and even harder to pin down that they're doing it because they feel like it's binding on them as a matter of international law. So while I agree that's what we should be doing, uh, in practice, I don't see it happening consistently uh, in our courts or in the international legal system, which leaves uh, the concerns that, that I've expressed. And Professor Brillmeyer, we don't want to leave you out if you have a concluding remark. Um, I would just say that in some respect, it's unfortunate, a tendency that I see um, in a lot of, uh, a lot of students and uh, young, young people and knowing that uh, many students are in the audience, I'll say this anyway, uh, there's a tendency, whether you're coming at it from one political point of view or another, to take your argument and really run with it and stretch it to the maximum. That really goes on in the case of uh, human rights and some other areas of international law. It's made um, 
people who are in charge of governing extremely cautious about putting their toe in the water for fear that uh, they're going to create something that they can't, uh, can't control. Um, and I see a lot of young people's scholarship that uh, throws caution to the wind in arguing for very expansive versions of rights. And it's something to think about when, uh, when, we, when we do our academic writing. Well, thank you all. Um, and I, I wanna thank all of the panelists uh, for their participation today and their very thoughtful remarks. Uh, thank you again to the Federalist Society and to Penn Law's student chapter. And with that, I turn it over to Eric. Thank you, Judge Branch, and thank you to all the panelists for this excellent conversation. I'm just here to say that uh, we will now be taking about a 20 minute break and reconvening for panel two at five o'clock. And th thank you very much. Once again, I look forward to seeing everyone soon. Thank you. <laughs>